So welcome everyone to Session. Session translates as touching the heart mind. Se is to touch or come close to. Shin is heart spirit or heart mind, or in other words, true nature. To touch our true nature, this is why we are here. We are here to not only touch it, but to absorb into it so that there is no thing touching something else. The toucher and the touched dissolve out of duality and into unity so that not even ideas of unity are left to get in the way. Of the various skillful means utilized here at Great Mountain Zen Center, today I have been asked to focus on one of them, the koan mu. So koan translates as public case. And these ancient public cases were and are used both to tear the fabric of conditioning away from our eyes and to test the clarity of a student or a transmitted master. And these koans go way back in our tradition, in our lineage. Um, there are somewhere around 750 or more koans that we do um, as part of our training um, if someone is going to become a teacher. And Mu is just one of them, but it's one of the big ones. It's one of the most famous ones, and it's what we call a breakthrough koan. These breakthrough koans are really important. And sometimes people will spend um, a month on Mu, a month on Mu, if they come already with some insight, or they may spend years and years. And Mu may be the thing that turns them away from Zen. They may come to Zen. Uh, they're doing well for a while, they get assigned Mu and they just struggle with it and struggle with it and they just get frustrated and leave and never come back. So Mu is, is really well known in, in the Zen world. There's even uh, some books about it. So Mu is like a tall wooden door or the tall wooden door at the entrance to the ancient Japanese monasteries where monks still to this day must sit in front of for three days before being allowed to enter. And yet equally, Mu is a much appreciated cool breeze on a stifling hot summer's day. Mu can feel cold and harsh, at least initially, and yet kind in the way that a math teacher who asks us to write our multiplication tables over and over again is kind. Mu will not make it far with the week of resolve or when the intention that is the wind on a person's sail is only a light breeze. A monk asked Joshu, has a dog Buddha nature or not? Joshu replied, Mu. This is the koan of Mu. It's very short. There are actually longer versions of this koan and there is also a version where Joshu replies with the opposite of Mu, which is yes. That's right, Mu means no. And some English speaking Zen communities here in the US and in Europe call this Joshu's no instead of Joshu's Mu. And maybe, I don't know because I haven't done this practice, but maybe they practice with no instead of Mu. And people wrestle with this question and try to, and spend way too much time trying to figure out does a dog have Buddha nature? Of course not. A dog does not have Buddha nature. Neither do you nor I. A dog is Buddha nature. You are Buddha nature. I am Buddha nature. Yet in saying this, this is only a finger pointing at the moon. So let's stop looking at the finger and get right to the moon. The practice of Joshu's Mu is just Mu, the moon itself. Mu. So Mu, Mu, Mu. No breath, just Mu. No pain, just Mu. No Mui. Just moo, 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 moo. No Trump, just moo. No COVID, just moo. No responsibilities, just moo. Moo when you wake up, moo when you lay down, moo when eating, moo when pooping, moo when making love, 
moo and cleaning up afterwards. Moo, moo, moo. How bad do you want to see the true nature of things? Are you willing to let it all go and see, hear, taste, smell, and feel only moo? Let it go. Let what go? Everything, body and mind. Can you let go of your intellect, your beliefs, your shoulds and shouldn'ts, your likes and dislikes? Moo. Is there a single thought worth cherishing? Seriously, is there a thought worth cherishing more than Moo? If your practice is Moo, will you let Moo win each time that Moo comes face to face, face to face with a thought stream? Will you let Moo erase everything? you just wrote on the whiteboard of your mind? Have you had this moment of decision when you realize during Zazen that you are thinking and you come to the point of letting go of the thoughts and return to the practice, but you don't? Mu is a practice of renunciation. I, Michael Mui Lewis, age 46, living in Berthoud, Colorado, hereby renounce the triple gem, me, myself, and I. I renounce my fascinating and colorful thoughts. I renounce my narratives about this person and that person. I renounce my dreams for the future and my regrets of the past. I renounce my ideas of what and how a Buddhist should act and how I want others to see and experience me. I renounce the idea that compassion is more important and better than hatred and that love conquers all. I renounce practice A, practice B, and practice C, which are all the cool and interesting meditations I saw on YouTube or read in books or learned from a podcast. I renounce renunciation. Mo There are stages in our practice over the course of our careers in meditation, and there are cycles of those stages. In the 10 ox herding pictures, this is one of the pictures. So there's 10 of these photos and they show this uh, process of a person going through the stages of coming to get a glimpse of one's true nature becoming enticed by it, wrestling with it, um, coming at peace with it, but there's still being a sense of separation. And then eventually coming to this place, the place of emptiness, shunyata. And then beyond shunyata is luminous emptiness. And there's another, this is the eighth, and then the ninth is colorful and wonderful and joyous, but still empty. And then the final stage, the final ox herding picture is this one. And this is where the person goes back to the world and integrates what they have just experienced. And so we go through these cycles through our practice over the years. We go through these stages, not always in a linear way. Sometimes we go up to a stage and then we cycle back around and wrestle again and then have a moment of emptiness or an experience of emptiness, integrate it. And we do it again and again and again. And each time the peace is more peaceful, the stability more stable, the freedom more free, the heart more open, and the integration more integrated. At least that's been my experience so far. Of the stages and cycles of practice, there are two distinctly different forms our practice takes. One is taking our hearts open into the world 
which was this one again, and doing what we can to relieve suffering while our developed depth of emptiness helps us maintain a balance of caring, but not being too attached to outcomes. The other is to forget the world, and that's this one again, emptiness, shunyata. To forget the world, to forget family, forget friends, the environment, the pleasure of food, alcohol and celebrations, life goals, finances, and more than anything else, to forget our conditionally developed identities and thought patterns. Emptiness, spaciousness, unity, no mind. We let go of everything. Standing on the edge of a cliff with our backs to the expansiveness behind us, we close our eyes and just let go and fall back. We step off the 10,000 foot pole. We completely drop off body and mind. No. So yes, there is a time to do our work in the world and put our cultivated minds and hearts to task. And equally, there's a time to forget about all of it and do our work beyond the realm of limited human, human perception. So why Mu? Why not the breath or Hara or Tong Lin or Shikantaza? All of these and the many more Buddhist and Zen meditations are profound skillful means. Each of these practices concentrate the mind's attention in their own specific ways and subtly work on the psyche in dissolving delusions. Mu is profound in its simplicity and its palpable clarity. You know when Mu is not happening. You really do. When practicing with the breath alone, without counting or visualizations of some kind, a monkey mind that, laps, that lacks stability can easily spend 90% of a meditation period drifting in the 10,000 directions without being aware of it while only 10% of that time is spent actually concentrating on the breath. And you can think, oh, I just spent 90% of the time concentrating on my breath, but you really didn't. That's been my experience. The breath is elusive and subtle, like a light breeze meandering through the forest. It's easy to miss. Mu is like a spotlight blinding everything in its path. Mu. When formally practicing Mu with the Roshis, though I know none of you will, it would behoove you to fill out the legal forms of petition to change your name and turn them into your local county clerk. You would change your first name to Mu, your middle name to Mu, and your last name also to Mu. When Bodhidharma sat in his cave facing a wall for nine years, there was only Mu. Now, I don't know if he was actually practicing Mu. The koan Mu actually hadn't uh, begun yet, as far as we know, as far as I know. Um, it ha uh, most of these koans were created between 600 and 1100 <coughs> in the current era. Um, but Bodhidharma was doing something, some kind of tool, maybe Shikantaza, um, but other tools to bring him into this moment of thusness. So he sat there for nine years, as the story goes. Because Bodhidharma knew from his personal experience the depth of resolve needed to see one's true nature, Bodhidharma tested a young monk who was seeking the truth. Master Wike cut off his arm to prove his determination and later became the first Chinese ancestor because Bodhidharma came from India and brought Zen, well, brought meditation to China. And then Huike was the first Chinese ancestor. So what are you willing to give up?
an arm. Please do not cut off an arm today. As our karmic paths um, really decide what we give up and what we don't give up. But hearing a talk like this, having a relationship with the Roshis, it plants a seed in that karmic destiny and it changes the course of things. And so we have a decision right now today to ask ourselves, what are we willing to give up? And really on the cushion, it's just those thoughts, it's the beliefs. And then off the cushion, can we take that practice into walking to the bathroom from the cushion, to washing the dishes, taking a shower, moo, 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 everywhere we go. Moo. I want to bring up the practice of the three greats. Great faith, great doubt, and great determination. We've already talked about great doubt quite a bit. This doubt is not in ourselves and ultimately not in our teachers or in Zen. It is doubt in our conditioned way of seeing the world and ourselves. And yes, doubt will arise with one's mentors, with the community, and with the teachings. This is healthy and discernment should be made when choosing a teacher and setting and a set of teachings in a community. But once the decision is made, the external commitment serves as the container for the inner world of beliefs and preferences to be challenged and dissolved. So ultimately, it's a part of us having doubt in another part of us in a healthy way. We've also already talked about great determination a little bit. It takes a person of character to go further down the road of Zen than just occasional medication, meditation and listening to a Dharma talk here and there. To push through the thickets of ego, doubt in ourselves, pain, fear, and challenges by our teachers, we must dig deep. And as Roshi often says, keep going. But now I really wanna get into great faith. Mu requires faith. Mu is not sexy like Om. There are no t-shirts, bracelets, or henna tattoos. Mu is like the Quaker, alone on a grassy hill in overalls and a sun hat without even the shade of a tree or a friend in sight. Mu is the pockets of our pants pulled out and empty. Mu is a cereal bowl with nothing in it, except Mu, of course. When you open the fridge, can you see nothing but Mu? When driving on the road, nothing but Mu. Do you trust the teachings of Zen and these, Zen and these teachers of Zen? Mu will test your faith. Mu is the mirror that shows us how hooked we are to the pleasures of the world and to the familiar pleasures of the thinking mind. Pleasures that often aren't so pleasurable, but it's better than what we don't know. I speak from my own experience. I get bored with Moo. I get headaches from Moo. Moo seems stupid sometimes. I sound like a cow mooing. I used to want to do a more sexy Tibetan practice and I wondered what I'd gotten myself into with Zen. I questioned the validity of our teachers and of this lineage. I read about all the scandals in American Zen and looked at the declining state of Zen in Japan, but then I got some help. Mm -hmm. Mu took all the scheming bullshit in my mind away. Mu, I trust you. It is not Mu itself that awakens the mind to thusness. Mu is the rake that cultivates the field. So I want to talk to you about the actual practice of Mu. We can Mu in with the breath and we can Mu out with the breath. We can Mu constantly 
like the never ending blue sky as the breath comes in and out of the sky, which is kind of like this, like, it's really hard to explain, but in my own mind, I can do this where there's this constant like, and it's not limited by the in, the inhale or the exhale, it's just a constant moo. And it just turns all thoughts off. And I can do that walking, eating, doing most things that don't require cognitive effort. Moo can get stuck in the head. And this is okay sometimes, um, but it can create headaches. And I have had headaches from Moo before. So to bring Moo into the body, there's all kinds of things that we can do with Moo. So if, for example, we can do earth breathing with Moo. So we can inhale Moo up through the earth, through our chakra system, through the perineum, the pelvic seat, up through the belly, up into the lungs, and then exhale Moo out through the mouth or the nose. We can inhale moo through the heart and we can visualize moo coming in through the chest, into the heart, and then right back out or out through our mouth or our nose. We can close our eyes and with our mind's eye, we can look down into the belly right into the bottom of the ocean where it's very still. And all there is is some algae maybe floating very calmly. And right there is Moo. And we can rest right in the lap of Moo, right in the belly, the Hara. When we inhale, the entire body can expand with Mu. And when we exhale, the body can contract with Mu. Mu in and Mu out. Mu can come from every cell in the body and all come right here to the third eye and just come as a very powerful point of energy. Mu can come through the crown of the head, through the crown, crown chakra. We can open a space in the crown of the head and bring Mu in from the universe, from the sky, from the clouds, down into the lungs or all the way into the belly and then right back out. When we notice that thoughts arise, we don't judge the thoughts. We don't hate the thoughts. We don't think, oh God, I really suck at this. I'm a terrible meditator. We just say moo. That's it. And suddenly, all those thoughts are washed away like the surf carrying away a word written in the sand. So when emotional energy comes strong in the body, let every particle of that emotional energy become mu. And let the narrative of that emotional energy also become mu. There's no shame or anger. Now, it might start out as shame or anger, but as soon as we mu with it, and it's just moo. It's no longer anger. It's just moo with that energy. You can call it angry energy if you want, but angry is just a word. It's just a label. Now it's just energy. Once the story's gone, it's just energy in the body. 
And it's just moo at that point. The same thing with sadness. We can just moo, moo. Same thing with joy, shame, guilt. It's natural that these emotions arise on the cushion and we want them to. This is our karma working itself out. If we avoid emotions, uh, that's spiritual bypassing. We meditate to create, we meditate for a lot of different reasons, but one reason is we meditate to create this container that can handle all of that karmic energy from today, from yesterday, from our childhood, and from who knows where, previous lives, if that's something you believe in. So we make space for that emotional energy and Mu takes the story of it away. Once the story and the narrative get attached to that emotional energy, we're not actually healing. We might actually be exacerbating it, making it worse, reifying the story, reifying the wound. But when we take the story away and we just feel the feeling, take the story away with Mu or with your breath or with the sound of one hand or whatever your practice is and just feel the energy of emotion. That's when we're doing the healing and the transformation that energy transform transforms into something else. So it's not Mui crying. It's not even Moo crying or Mike mooing. You could say it's moo mooing, or even better yet, just mooing. Just moo. So I'm gonna wrap it up. We've been sitting here for a long time. So in conclusion, I'd like to say that not everyone is in the cycle of their practice where moo is the most appropriate skillful means. Sometimes allowing the mind to wander is the most compassionate practice and it actually can allow thought energy to exhaust itself. So when the mind has stabilized to a certain degree, Mu can be like putting on a pair of glasses on it um, after actually having taken off the glasses. So sometimes Mu can feel extra. Sometimes the mind is so clear, so clear that the breath is enough and we can sit in this clear open space of shikantaza. And we don't need Mu. Mu is a wonderful handrail that takes us through stormy weather. So just the last couple sentences here to share. So in Mumon's Gateless Gate, which is the uh, first book of koans that we study here in our lineage after we do the miscellaneous koans. Joshu's Mu is the very first koan. Mu is the key that opens the gate, helping us realize that the gate is simply a cloud of thoughts and identity creating agendas, obscuring a delightful and dreamy reality. The key is now in your hands. Use it as you like.